Hey there, this is Nathan Crane, founder of the Panacea Community and executive producer of Unify Fest. And I'm super happy to welcome you to the second annual Self-Reliance Summit. This summit is dedicated to bringing you real practical advice and inspiration for living more self-reliant, interconnected, and sustainable. And our next expert speaker today is my friend and colleague, Mr. Paul Wheaton. Paul Wheaton is the creator of the largest permaculture forum on the internet. You may know it very well as permies.com. He's been crowned the Duke of Permaculture and has released over 290 podcasts on many permaculture topics ranging from eco-building to frugality to cast iron cookware and everything in between. Paul's an advanced certified master gardener, permaculture designer, farmer, and community leader. Not to mention, he accomplishes all this while rocking his spiffy overalls. So I don't see him on today, Paul. Oh, there you go. Oh, there, you go. oh, there ah. they are. They're hidden. <laughs> hey, Paul, thanks, thanks so much for being with us, man. Hey, it's glad to, I'm glad to be here, Nate. I'm looking forward to doing this. This was pretty cool last year. Well, we're so looking forward to this year's, too. Taking, taking it to a whole new level with, uh, with video here so people can actually see what's going on. And uh, So let's dive in. Today we're talking about... Hugo cultures and permaculture food systems. One of my favorite topics. I know a topic that Paul, you have so much insight and hands-on experience with, and a lot to share. So maybe you can start by giving us some insight about Hugo cultures and actually what they are. This is the second most popular topic that I'm asked about, uh, and and it's and when I go to present and we come cover a topic that's anywhere close to this. Seems like there's an hour and a half of questions uh, for this. But in a nutshell, it is soil on wood. And uh, usually it's kind of stacked into a raised bed garden kind of a thing. But the magic comes that if you can get this to be six or seven feet tall, then you can grow all your favorite garden plants without any irrigation or any fertilizer. So the first year, it is kind of like a normal garden. The second year is better. The third year is the amazing year where you don't have to irrigate anymore. And everything just goes right. There, that's it in a nutshell. Does that help? That's it in a nutshell. So let's give people a visual who don't know, right? Inside, you're filling it with logs and wood, a lot of carbon, uh, and then you're filling it up with dirt. Now, what, what other? Uh, explain that a little bit more so people get the understanding of how it works. So if you put a big log on the inside and uh, the soil on top of it, the soil, of course, is going to be loaded with all kinds of nitrogen and microbial uh, life, uh, then they're going to be the perfect things that lead to composting. So then the log will slowly compost. It'll be a very, very slow compost. It'll break down and it will rot. And then as it rots, then all that rotten wood becomes parking spaces for nutrients and water. Uh, and then eventually it'll rot so much that some of the smaller sticks will have uh, rotted down to the point that they're much smaller than they originally were, thus leaving air pockets. And it helps to facilitate more air moving through the soil. Now, one of the, the benefits of till is that you'll go and you'll break up all the ground and it forces all this oxygen into the soil and it also kills a lot of the microbial life in the soil. So the, the dead microbial life becomes nutrients for plants and all that air helps to give everything a big boost. That's why people love to till. Uh, now, of course, every time you till, you lose 30% of your organic matter. And so you do that over and over and over again, you're quickly going to turn your soil into dirt, which resembles cement, which is not going to be good for growing much of anything. So. With hugel culture, in a way, you get all the perks of no-till plus all the perks of till. Um, now, you mentioned wood. Now, we got wood and sticks on the inside. And there are some people that are really tempted to use uh, a chipper. Don't do that. <laughs> the bigger the chunk of wood, the better. It's very rare that you want something smaller in your hugel culture bed. And then if you do a lot of wood chips, this is usually the first question I get is like, 
you know, doesn't that take up all the nitrogen? And it's like, that's called nitrogen immobilization. So if you use a lot of wood chips or teeny tiny bits of wood, you end up with nitrogen immobilization, which means that your growies won't get very much nitrogen for several years. You'll be growing almost nothing but nitrogen fixing plants such as legumes. Um, so I would say that the thing to do is stick with the bigger wood. I would also advocate making things as weird as possible on the inside. It doesn't hurt to make it weird on the outside too. And by that I mean weird shapes, weird heights, and then on the inside, weirdness is going to come from sometimes it's this kind of wood, sometimes it's another kind of wood. Sometimes you might throw in some hay for sport. Maybe you're going to have like uh, some dairy animals and you're going to throw poop in there. That'll be great. Don't spread it out evenly. Don't do like what they do in lasagna gardening. Lasagna gardening is like 20 times better than trying to grow on concrete. But Kugel culture done this way is five times better than that. So uh, make it weird inside. Some spots have more soil, some spots have more wood. Some spots have more manures or hay, and some spots have more of whatever you threw out of the kitchen last week. Some spots have some garden soil that you got from some other garden that's doing really well. So the weirder you make it on the inside, the better. That's diversity on the inside. On the outside, Make sure to give it lots of interesting shapes to your hula culture beds. Don't just do straight lines. And sometimes some spots might be eight feet tall and some spots might be only five and a half feet tall. And uh, some spots might be thicker or thinner. Lots of diversity on the outside, lots of diversity on the inside. Nice. Uh, what, you know, what I think of when I think of hula cultures, I, I think what we're trying to do is emulate building a multi-hundred-year forest floor in maybe an afternoon, right? I mean, we're really trying to stack up this natural system so it's going to self-fertilize and compost itself as, as a forest floor would do if it was kind of left alone with, with animals. Um, over maybe hundreds of years, we can do it much, much more rapidly, yeah? So, of course, one of the things from permaculture is observation. And so if you go out into a really old forest that has never been logged or never been screwed with in any way, you get out there and you will find uh, uh, nurse logs. So some tree fell over 100 years ago, and now there's all this life growing on top of it. Um, and if you look around, you'll see that this life that's growing on top of it are the water-sensitive plants. And then 10 feet away, these things aren't growing 10 feet away the soil over there isn't holding enough moisture to keep them alive year to year, but they are on top of this log. So observation, and yes, we are trying to just cheat our way into doing what we've observed, creating something that's like a nurse log environment. However, this has been going on for decades, and we have lots and lots of experience with this technique, and we've optimized it. So a lot of people have tried a lot of different things, and we've found some things that work better than others. So let, let's talk about climates and types of hugel cultures. Like what, what climates and soils are, are best for above ground versus maybe below ground hugels? I would like to steer people away from below ground hugels, mm. but I am but one voice in the broad permaculture community. Um, I'm a powerful advocate of adding texture to the landscape. And so a lot of the people that do hugel culture in ground, so their ground remains flat, then they have not added texture to the landscape. So what you end up with is this homogeneous flat space, which of course has a sweet spot where the hugel culture is. But now you're also, you're bending over to, uh, to, to harvest whatever it is that you're growing, which is inconvenient. <laughs> um, but on top of that, uh, a great thing about adding texture to the landscape and adding a great big six foot high bump is that like let's say the bump is currently situated so that it's one half is facing south and one half is facing north. Mm. Well, now you've got a side that will be much warmer in the winter time, so you'll have a much longer growing season, and you have another side that's much cooler in the summertime. And so you can grow a lot of heat-intolerant things. 
So uh, I, I think that then you're gonna, you know, then you're gonna curve this in such a way that some of it's facing east and some of it's facing west, and some of it is facing northwest. Well, some of it's facing southeast, and all the different possible variations. And so then each plant will find its perfect niche to grow in for optimal growth. I think this is. I, the other thing is, is that when it's like that, when you've got like a, an above ground thing, the top of the hugu culture bed tends to be really dry. And then the bottom edges of the hugu culture bed tend to be very wet. So now you've got diversity and moisture. Um, it goes into diversity in a lot of other things too. Like a lot of the seeds tend to pile up down towards the edges, whereas the stuff at the top tends to not have very much competition. Um, Whereas if it's flat, if it's just all flat, then everything is exactly the same everywhere. Right. With the exception, of course, of whatever you've hidden underground. So I, I wish to suggest that they go for tall. Now, I realize that people that are living in cities are kind of like, if I built something out in my front yard that is seven feet tall, like you suggest, my neighbors will freak out. And... Um, <clears throat> Fear not, I have evil, devious plots to help with this. <laughs> First, if you, if you think that your neighbors will freak out at seven feet, then I think most of the time they won't freak out at something that's two feet tall. Mm. And then mysteriously, it just happens to get taller with each passing year. And it, it sneaks it in. So that's long-term gardening. I know a lot of gardeners, it's like, I want to grow everything right now. Right. And perma permaculture is more about let's look at the next 10 years. Right. A lot of our plans are like 10 year plans, 20 year plans. And there, you know, granted, there's some stuff you do the first year and there's some plans for five years. But a lot of it where permaculture really sings is in that five to 15 year area. And so we're doing things on a longer term scale. Nice. Did so, I answer your question, or did I just run off under the weeds with stuff? A little bit of both, but I, I think it was good. Okay. So, right. so we're talking above ground. Hugel's definitely recommended, uh, and, and, and I, I agree. I think that's, that's uh, a better way to go. Um, one, one, uh, one thing I was thinking as you were talking is <clears throat> um, planting in the Hugel culture, right? So ideal places on this giant mound you know for people who don't know if you can vision you're basically building a mound right that may be 10 feet long maybe 100 feet long maybe 100 yards long but uh, you're building a mound so fruit trees at the bottom certain things in the middle how are you planting and spacing plants and trees and, and nitrogen fixers etc I think that the all-time favorite for nearly everybody is that at the top you plant sunchokes. And that's because that's where it's dry, that's where the wind is blowing, that's where the temperature fluctuations are the biggest. Um, and, and so sunchokes tolerate all of that. Um, I, think, I think I always start off just planting sunchokes up there and then I wait and see if something else shows up up at the top and does okay. But it's pretty much dominant sun jokes you're, you're talking um, you're talking in the in the very top of it not on very top. not on one side or the other just right along the top right along the edge i mean you end up with plenty of them growing up there and then you grow everything else down below that um i'm trying to think of like what else i plant at the top of hugel cultures but it's like sun jokes are kind of like one of the ultimate foods and the fact that it grows so well on that top edge thus kind of protecting and nursing everything else i don't know i i i abuse it i suppose i'm treating it poorly i should i should be nicer to the sun choke <laughs> but this is uh sun chokes are uh, the most calories per acre for any other plant I, I right from from everything i've heard of i haven't heard of any other plant that produces more calories per acre um and then they're perennial they come back year after year and they tolerate the worst possible conditions now you asked about trees and a lot of people subscribe to the idea that the tree goes at the bottom of the hugel culture. Um, you know, thus it gets all the best water and stuff like that. Um, and then it's, and then of course, if you're going to harvest from the tree, it's a little easier to harvest if it's lower to the ground and, and you can get your orchard ladder, you know, right up to it. Um, I will sometimes plant a tree a little ways up a hugel culture bed, like maybe halfway up. Um, 
But I would say that um, near the top, I find myself a lot of times planting squashes um, and, and melons uh, because they're going to have great big leaves and they're going to vine all over. They might vine over both sides and they'll, they'll really spread out. And um, I don't know, I think that they must have a really deep root system and they'll go find those roots down deep. Tomatoes, I tend to plant about halfway up. Um, and uh, they get just the right level of moisture. I would say that I'm going to keep my onions near the bottom um, because onions, when I'm out hiking, I, I used to, believe it or not, I'm a mighty big old geezer now, but when I was a young fella, I, I went hiking in the wilderness and, and, you know, I lived off the land as much as I could. And one of the things I harvested were wild onions, which were always found in swampy spots. And so I always think, you know, onions come from something relatively swampy. So I, I tend to plant my onions a, a little lower down. Uh, strawberries can do pretty good on the upper half. Um, I, I've never planted, I don't, I've never tried to plant raspberries into a hugel culture bed. Um, I, I kind of feel like raspberries will do great almost anywhere and I'll plant them away from the hugel culture and they'll, they'll do fine out there. Plus the way that they kind of, uh, uh, spread is like, uh, they, you know, I could, I could see them totally taking over a hugel culture bed without a lot of work. Right. And so I'd probably, I, I generally plant those outside of the hugel culture bed. What am I leaving? I'm sure, I know I'm leaving out tons of stuff. All, all of your beets and all of your, I, I think um, I'll plant beets anywhere. And if I'm planting like a new variety of something and I want to see what it's like, I'll do this crazy. Because of course, in permaculture, don't ever plant anything in rows. The other permaculture people will ridicule you. <laughs> They'll point at you and give you the stink eye. You don't want that. Because we want polyculture. We want everything to mix with everything else. But if I've got a new variety of something and I want to try it out, what I'll do is I'll plant it like from the bottom to the top in a diagonal line with a little marker at the bottom. And then that way I can find out like how did it do and see like did it do better at the top or at the bottom. Mm, that's a good idea. Um, is that, did I kind of answer your question well enough? Yeah, we got a lot of plants, um, trees. Fruit trees, uh, you know, legume, um, nitrogen fixing trees, uh, that sort of thing. Where are you planting your trees? So I would say that for a nitrogen fixture like a black locust, I would probably plant that on the cold side. Hmm. Uh, At the bottom, you're doing bottom, or you're doing halfway up, or I would. Oh, I. I I've only planted trees at the bottom, or or between the bottom and halfway up. And uh, a black locust, I would, I would do it on the cold side, on the, on the north-facing side, um, because it's going to grow to be an enormous tree, but it's, it's an amazing nurse plant for all the other species that are growing. So it actually shares its nitrogen as it's living. Um, and, uh, and plus, it's like the dappled leaves of it. It, it doesn't leaf out until like early summer. It, it waits until really, really late to leaf out. Right. Thus giving lots of opportunity for the soil to warm. So it's like, it's great to have them around, but they're not exactly a food species. So they're, a f I mean, they're first class in permaculture, but in my garden, they're kind of a second class species. And so it's kind of like on the north facing side, it'll grow up and it'll find all that southern exposure when it gets tall enough and it'll... It'll gather all that sunlight then, but it won't be blocking all of my precious stuff on the south-facing side. So, um, but for trees, trees are typically either at the base of the hugel culture or halfway up for me. Now, most permaculture people do it strictly at the base, um, but sometimes I kind of like the tree to be up and high and out of the way, and, and so I'll do it halfway up. Sometimes. I guess depends on what size you're going to be, you know, cutting, topping your trees if you are keeping them lower, or if you're planting dwarf trees or whatever, right? Oh, okay, you pushed a button. You pushed a button. <laughs> no, no dwarfs uh, with Paul, is that the deal? <laughs> so, so uh, uh, let's, it's from, from my perspective, and now I'm an odd duck in the permaculture world, and uh, uh, somehow I still get to be Duke. <laughs> they haven't de-duked me yet. 
Uh, <laughs> I think they're all, so, I think they're all too afraid. I, you know, <laughs> I, think, I think you got that kind of mafia hidden side to you somewhere. <laughs> that... <laughs> so, um, if you grow a tree, if you grow an apple tree as a transplant, it loses its taproot. And so, but a taproot is a magical, beautiful thing in the world of permaculture. Right. Most taprooted species will shoot that taproot down, that single taproot down, way, way, way freaky deep. And it will find nutrients and water and all kinds of fun things way down deep in the soil. And it'll bring them up and share them with all of its friends. And now it's got oodles and oodles of water and the friends might not have so much. And so now this is a way of bringing more water to plants that don't have a taproot. This is one of the primary reasons why we like polyculture so much. So <clears throat> if you're, so, so a dwarf tree, nearly all the dwarf trees that anybody's going to plant are going to come from uh, a Frankenstein technique called grafting. Mm, I've right. grafted arm onto this torso and I call it Frank, or Frank's monster. But anyway, it's grafting. And, and so um, it totally works, just like Frankenstein's monster might have worked in a piece of fiction written hundreds of years ago. But still, it's, it's kind of like this less than natural thing. Now, if you grow that apple tree from seed, you will most likely get a full-sized tree. But it'll have a taproot. And so you've got this, this amazing taproot mixed into everything, and you'll probably have much more awesome apples growing from seed. Now, of course, there is a little trick, and there's a lot of people that, that pass around. There's a myth going around that only 1 in 20,000 will be edible. And actually what they mean to say is only 1 in 20,000 would be able to com compete in a commercial marketplace with the Macintosh. And so it's like, but that's not what we're trying to do. Right. What happen is, is 20% of the apples will be amazing. 20% will be uh, uh, from, a, from a, a group that we call spitters. I think you might know what that means. So, you know. And then, and then the remaining 60% will be something in between, like only good for pie or only good for sauce or only good for fresh eating right away or something like that. They'll, they won't be multifunctional. And they won't be long keepers, but they'll be, they'll, they'll have a place. They could, they could be good bird food or, or good animal food or good compost, right? Exactly where I was going with this. So it's like the spitters turn out to be totally delicious to chickens and hogs. Right. And uh, then the other thing is like, if, let's say you plant that apple tree a little ways up on your culture bed. And then there's all these trees that you can't reach. Ah, ah, I can't reach. I can't reach. That's called... Those, those apples up there, that's called the pig's food. <laughs> it will come down eventually, right. and then the pigs will eat it. Right. <laughs> be amazing. So uh, Fukuoka, Masanobu Fukuoka, uh, had this great technique where he was kind of like, okay, everything that's like up to three feet high, that's for all the critters um, to eat you know, early on. Everything from three feet to about eight and a half feet, which is what we can easily get, you know, that's for people. And then everything above that is like winter food for the, for the critters. So now you asked a question, but in your question, you pushed a button and I had to go off. And now I forgot what the question was. <laughs> That's all right. I think we got a pretty good answer. I, I don't even remember what the question was. Um, <laughs> uh, but, but no, moving forward though. Um, so I, I, have, I have a three tier terrace. Here at our house, and I'm wanting to do hugels on each one, and then you know run the water so you know and swells so that each one goes down. Where do you put the hugel in a sweat in, in in a terrace, and you know how do you make how do you make that work so it's efficient? It's it's south facing. The terraces are south facing. Okay, you said a word which pushed a button. <laughs> okay. Pushing all your buttons today, awesome. Man, what the what is up with you? All right, I, I need to clear something up. Um, and so terraces, good everywhere, universally, around the world, terraces have been shown to be just excellent.
but you use this word swale. And I just want to be clear, swales are awesome in tropical and subtropical climates. And you might do, you might do five or 10% of your land as swales in cold climates, because when summer rolls around, you want to have a place that's a really cool place. In fact, you could do a, like a really huge swale and put a picnic table in the bottom of it. <laughs> <laughs> and then come summer, it's like, oh, it's so hot. It's like, everybody to the swale. And then you'll be nice and cool. Because basically what you're making is a frost pocket. And a frost pocket is not something that we really want in our colder climates. Right. So, you know, however, a terrace is immune to the frost pocket. The frost, the cold air as it moves down and is looking for a frost pocket to hang out in, it'll just go right on by a terrace. So um, important e to keep in mind. E even if you have swells in the terrace, it'll still go... No. Or no? Uh, once you put a swale in a terrace, you've got a frost it's, it's pocket. Swale? Yeah. Have you made a swale? It's a swale now, isn't it? Right. How do you make a swale in a terrace and have it be anything other than a swale? Right. Ah, got you there. <laughs> so it's um, a ter it's a terraced swale. Okay. Now you, okay. I can see how <laughs> that could happen, and that's like comedy, right? <laughs> <laughs> That would be a big swale. <laughs> Look, I made a swale that's 80 <laughs> feet tall, and I put terraces on one side. <laughs> so um, I, I kind of feel like now, now there are, I'm going to say that when it comes to the whole thing about swale in uh, uh, colder climates, my position is, is probably more the exception than the rule. And, um, uh, and Sepp Holzer does something where it's kind of like, a stubby swale, he calls them uh, crater gardens, or you know, in, in English it's going to be uh, uh, crater gardens. And so basically, a great big pit, and it'll have terraces around the pit. And uh, he he thinks it's amazing for cold climates. I'm having I'm still struggling with the whole concept of the um, uh, frost pocket. Now, another one that people try to do is they make something called a hugel swale. And so this, this is where the lip of the swale, the downhill lip of the swale, is riddled with woody bits. And um, still a frost pocket. Still mm. a frost pocket. So I actually advocate that what you're going to do is you're going to make your hugel culture run perpendicular to your contour lines. So a swale is basically a long, skinny pond. It's all level. It's not even a ditch. A ditch, a ditch goes kind of downhill a little bit, and then your water runs towards one end of the ditch. Right. So a swale is all perfectly level. So, so if it rains, it'll fill up and be like this long, skinny pond. Um, what I do is, and it's, it's all on contour. They call that being on contour. And uh, what I recommend is to make your hugel cultures be perpendicular to contour. And um, the reason is, is that then the cold air, when it starts heading right for you, then it's going to go right on by. It's not going, there's, you're not making any frost pockets. Now, the next thing is, is that what, um, one of the things that Sepp Holzer has done, and in his amazing videos, there's a three DVD set uh, that, that he has that, that has so much about cold, cold climates. It's so amazing to watch. Um, but it's really old. And so when you look at it, he's got all these hugel culture beds, and they're all straight lines and parallel. Now, in 2009, after watching those DVDs, like at the time it was VHS tapes, but, but in 2009, I'd watch those each like, I don't know, 18 times each or something. And so, and I met him. And, and so I, I then told him about my idea of like having them be kind of lined up up and down the hill and curvy. And so if the curves kind of intersect, and this is an opportunity, of course, to let your artistic stuff flow, um, but if the little curvy bits intersect, then no matter which way the wind blows, the wind can't get in it. Now, his straight lines were designed in such a way to be uh, contrary to the prevalent wind direction so that the wind couldn't get below. But I think that at once in a while, the wind is going to line up with those and then get down in there. And it's kind of like, thus ruining the whole idea. Because 
if you can keep the wind out, you get to retain more moisture and it stays warmer. Because wind is, is desiccating, it's very drying, and it's also very chilling. And so we want to keep the wind off of our growies. Get away, wind! You're screwing everything up. And so a little bit of wind is okay, but too much wind is a problem. So I like to make them very curvy and interlocking. So, um, but at the same time, kind of up and down hillish so that the air can move down. I proposed this to him and he said, catastrophe. <laughs> and <clears throat> I, I don't know why it's a catastrophe. He didn't go into a lot of detail because he does this. Oh, we're not talking anymore. So <laughs> he only speaks German. I only speak English. So, you know, we have a little bit of a communication barrier right there. But when his book came out, it had curvy lines in it. I'm going to pretend that that came from me. <laughs> I'm sure he'll say it didn't, but I'm going to pretend it came from me. So anyway, um, and once again, I've forgotten what your question was. <laughs> so, well, what you're, so you're saying your hoogles don't have to be on contour. They can even be on heels and up and down and all kinds of shapes and, and, and directions and sizes. I think that if you wanted to make them on contour, that would probably be a really smart thing for where it gets incredibly hot and where it's hot all the time and you don't have any challenges with length of growing season. I'm in Montana and so length of growing season is very important. Uh, and so, in fact, I gotta say that if you're looking to extend your growing season, the first thing you should do is raise beds just two feet off the ground. It'll buy you two weeks on either end of, this, of the season. So, you know, if, when your growing season's only 90 days, you just added another 30 days to your growing season. That's a huge jump. You, now you can suddenly grow so much more. Now you do it six or seven feet tall, you gain even more. Mm. And then if you've got a slope that you can work with, then you can do things to keep any kind of cold air away from your stuff by channeling it by correct placement of hugel culture beds. Nice. Yeah, that especially be helpful with, with that late, like we, I'm in San, I grew up in Montana, as you know, so I know all about that cold weather, but I'm in Santa Fe now, and even though we get 300 days of sun, uh, we get this late frost in usually the middle of May that comes in and just like freezes everything to death. And then, you know, if you planted anything before then, you know, about 60% of it is gone, which happened to me last year. They told me, I said, when's the last frost? They said, uh, you start planting after May 15th. So uh, it was like 85 degrees on May 15th last year. And I was like, this is amazing. I'm going to start planting today. And on May 16th, everything froze to death, you know. So, um, so that will give you two weeks additional. It's going to help protect against that frost. It does. It does. So you should be able to plant on May 1st. Nice. And, and your, the frost that you have that comes on May 16th, chances are that it's, you know, whereas I think earlier you suggested it was a hard frost, which oftentimes means something on the order of like, okay, 32 degrees is going to be frost, and a hard frost might be like 22 degrees, whereas a light frost is going to be 30 degrees, 31 degrees. So adding that two feet is going to protect you from some of your lighter frosts. So, um, but you know, yeah, when you have a hard frost, like you're down to 22, it's like everything, everything on your raised bed is going to get hit too, but it'll get hit with like a light frost. So, and, and plus some of your plants are going to be, uh, very sensitive to any frost, like even the lightest frost. And some of your plants are going to be able to tolerate a light frost. So some of your stuff might still go. Now, now when we're talking about terraces, or are you considering a terrace as a raised bed? Because it is, right? I want to go with. Uh, kind of, sort of. Kind of, <laughs> even raise it up a little more. Well, <clears throat> there is a theory that that cold air is this invisible gelatinous gob that is just massive, and it's going to come down to your site and it's going to move down your site. So if you have a terrace, you probably have uh, some slope to your land, and so. Um, uh, now, if you just have terraces and that's all you have, I would think that this big glob of cold air is going to hit everything. And it's just, it's just going to cover it all. Whereas what I would do is, um, with the terraces, I would try to put hugel cultures in some strategic places 
to try and direct that cold blob away from other hugel culture beds so that they will stay much warmer. Mm. Now, if you've got a raised bed that's kind of facing up and downhill, then when that cold blob comes through, there's a good chance that it will sink and be lower than your raised bed. But if you put the raised bed on contour, like on the lip of the terrace, mm -hmm. then it's going to probably trap that cold air and be a frost pocket. So if your raised beds are running um, alongside of these cold blobs, then you're probably going to gain that two weeks. If you put it on contour, you're probably not going to gain anything. Right. Does that help? Yeah, yeah, that helps. Now, you're in Santa Fe, so you've got a, you've got you've got some elevation in combination with being south. Right. So when summer rolls around, you get to experience all of it. <laughs> right. You get oodles of summer, and and it's going to get to be um, bonkers hot. So you're going to benefit from a little bit of column A and a little bit of column B. That cold, that cold pocket's going to help a little bit in the summertime is what you're saying. So you, I would think that you're going to make some cold pockets. You're going to make some frost pockets. You might want to put in a swale here and there. But I would also think that that's going to be more the exception than the norm. You're going to probably want to have something that's more going to be uh, uh, cultures trying to divert the cold. In fact, maybe what you'll do is you'll divert the cold into one of your strategically located frost pockets. You might even try to make it a place where it's a gathering place in the summertime for outdoors. Let's all go outside and hang out where all the cold air is pooling and uh, where we've, we've planted some shade trees as well. And sure, it's 110, but it feels like it's 75 in this spot that we've created permaculture style yeah isn't that so funny when i'm um i started running in the in the mountains recently and um which i absolutely love and encourage everyone to do um, <laughs> i'm training for i decided to train for an ultra marathon I, I guess a little bit crazy so but but what's funny is i'll be running and it's like freezing um at like six or seven in the morning and all of a sudden i get hit in this pocket of like massive warmth it's like it just was like 65 degrees it just hit me and i've been paying attention to that like oh how is these warm and cold pockets happening in these hills as i'm running through them it's very fascinating to be able to work with you know the the to create places you want more heat and places you want more cold and um, so hugo culture is a good way to do that that's cool so i've got a three dvd set called world domination gardening and that's kind of the theme of all three DVDs. And so we're, we literally have out some um, uh, earth moving equipment and we're changing, there's, we, we dig a pond uh, and we seal it without a liner and we build some swales. We, it's down in San Diego. So in fact, we duplicated the workshop in Montana. So it's half of it's in San Diego and half of it's in Montana. Um, and it's actually kind of inland from San Diego. So it's desert country. Um, and uh, so we're talking about all of these things, how to make things warmer in the wintertime and cooler in the summer, because this particular site did get some light frosts. And so we needed to, that we wanted to have some spots where we could grow things that uh, were perennials that were frost sensitive. And I think they wanted to grow a macadamia tree. And uh, so at the same time, we wanted to uh, grow uh, some things in the summertime, which would otherwise just get totally wiped out by the heat that they have in the summer. Right, right. No, it's a great DVD set. I actually have it, and we'll put a uh, we'll put a link right below this this video. So anyone who wants to pick up a copy, click the link below and get uh, become a world dominating gardener. Yes, yes. <laughs> Did you like it? Did you enjoy it? <laughs> yeah, it's great. It's great. Um, I've got a, like a dozen DVDs. I'm, I'm pulling back out again, getting ready to. I'm getting the getting the permaculture gardening fever. You know, now that winter's over here and and summer's on its way here where we're at. So getting excited. August, August is the best time to do your earthworks. And so um, uh, maybe July, but when it's dry is the best time uh, to do it. So it's like that season's coming up. Yes, yes it is. So awesome. I know, I mean, we could talk about Hugo cultures for hours. I know over at permies.com, you've got threads on Hugo cultures 
galore. Um, definitely want to encourage people to head over to permies.com. Check out the threads over there. Um, get Paul's DVD set. Highly recommended. And uh, got a couple other websites to share with folks. Um, an event I want to share that's coming up in September, Unify Fest. It's in Santa Fe, um, September 22nd through 25th. We have permaculture. We have uh, basket weaving, how to make your own baskets out of like salt cedar and willow. We have all kinds of workshops, uh, medicine making, a lot of self-reliance stuff, a lot of sustainability stuff, but then a lot of amazing music, keynotes. Um, you know, yoga, health, all kinds of cool stuff. Plus, we got Paul Wheaton. So, he's actually, I'll be a keynote speaker. He's a keynote speaker. He's uh, also on a panel, community building panel. Got a lot of wisdom to share on on communities as well. Um, be talking a lot about permaculture. So, like, that's a ninety minute keynote. So, you'll get so much more from that. Come out to Unify Fest. Come and join us. Have a lot of fun in Santa Fe. Uh, I'll put a link below as well. Unifyfest.com. And finally, if you missed any of the interviews during the Self-Reliance Summit, you can own them all. Just upgrade. There's an upgrade link on this page uh, somewhere. Click that, and you'll see all the ownership options. Uh, that way you can watch these over and over again. Other than that, Paul, I appreciate you so much, man. This has been, this has been a great interview. It's been fun as always, Nathan. Absolutely. Uh, glad to see your smiling face, and, uh, and thanks for sharing all your wisdom. And uh, thank you all for tuning in. We'll talk to you on the next interview. Take care.